All right, it's two o'clock. Like, we're going to start with get the meeting started. I'd like to start with the Pledge of Allegiance. So, if everyone could please rise, please stand. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God. Justice for all. <laughs> all right. So I would like to um, ask the commission members to consider adopting a motion to have me serve as today at today's meeting as the temporary non-voting chair to conduct the meeting. So moved. Thank second. you, Marty. Second. Dan McCormick, we have had seconds. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Judy Jacobson. I'm the interim executive director of the Central Crime Balance Commission, and I'll be serving as the moderator for today's meeting. I'd like to perform a roll call of the members present, starting with Town of Brookhaven. Emily Pines as the designee. Town of Southampton. Uh, Marty Shea for Supervisor Jay Schneiderman. Thank you. Tanner Riverhead. Dan McCormick, designee for Supervisor Aguiar, Tanner Riverhead. Thank you. Suffolk County. Dorian Dale for Suffolk County. Thank you. Okay. So we have, I'm uh, noting that we have a quorum present of four members. And I just want to proceed with a little, some information. The notice of this meeting followed the open meetings law as amended by executive order 202.1 and is as a subsequently extended, which allows meetings to take place remotely. This is the March 17th, 2021 regularly scheduled meeting of the Central Pine Barrens Commission. The meeting is being recorded in the Zoom application and will be posted on the commission's website for viewing and listening after the meeting and minutes will also be prepared as usual. I just want to pause a minute. I have to shut my door. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry about that. Okay. So now we're going to move on to the agenda under item 1A, public comments. The meeting will be, the public will be able to directly participate and provide comment during the public comment sections at the beginning and end of today's agenda. Unless providing public comment, the audio will be muted and video feeds disabled for the entirety of the commission's meeting. For the public comment sections on the agenda, the emails that have been received through info at pb.state.my.us will be read and then the public will be provided the opportunity to speak by selecting the raise your hand feature in Zoom or by entering your request in the chat feature. Please make sure you are properly identified with first and last names so we can call on you to speak. Once you are selected, please limit your comments to two minutes. You will receive an indication from staff when you're approaching the two minute mark and be asked to finalize your comments. The opportunity to provide public comment will be then made available to individuals participating by telephone. So under item 1A, public comments, I will start by reading the letters received via email. The first letter I received was from the Honorable Peter Satorius, the mayor of the village of Quag, uh, addressed to the Central Primaries Commission. Dear Central, uh, as stated March 11, 2021, Dear Central Primaries Joint Planning and Policy Commission, this letter is to confirm that the village of Quag fully supports the application of the Quag Wildlife Refuge for Pine Barrens Commission approval to expand the refuge's existing nature education center building and to replace its maintenance build, excuse me, maintenance facility. More than a hundred acres of the Quag Wildlife Refuge are owned by the village of Quag and licensed to the Southampton Township Wildfowl Association, a not-for-profit corporation for the purpose of 
operating the refuge. That land includes all of the property on which the buildings that are the subject of the application are located. They're in resident zone and residential zone and exist as accessory structures to a permitted recreational use. The importance of the Quag Wildlife Refuge to the village of Quag and indeed the surrounding area as well cannot be overemphasized. It is hugely popular and well utilized facility that has been particularly important to residents over the past 12 months. It must be permitted to grow modestly as in the, this application in order to be able to accomplish its mission effectively. Sincerely, Peter Satorius, Mayor. The next um, letter or comments I've received via email is from Laura Fabrizio, co-founder of Merchants Bay Project. Dear commission members, I would like to express my support for the work that Quad Wildlife Refuge is asking permission for. The importance of the refuge is invaluable, both for community and for the environment. I think it's extremely important that while you must function within the laws set forth by the Pine Barrens Act, a property such as Quag Wildlife Refuge deserves the utmost attention and discretion when evaluating their needs to function and to grow. There's no other property remotely like the refuge and I believe strongly that special consideration needs to be given to such a wonderful place. Thank you for your consideration, Laura Fabrizio. Excuse me. The next uh, letter I received is from Aram B. Turchunian, dated March 8, 2021. Commissioners, I give the Quad Wildlife Refuge proposal my full and unqualified support. I urge you to approve the request as soon as possible. The Quad Wildlife Refuge is an essential part of environmental education for thousands of people annually. My family and I have benefited greatly through their outstanding programs. I credit the Quad Wildlife Refuge as motivating force is choosing my own environmental career. Please approve these vitally, vitally needed improvements as soon as possible. Sincerely, Aaron B. Ternuchian. Terchunian, excuse me, I'm with the pronunciation. <laughs> And the, the last letter I received is from Joseph O'Comer from Riverhead. It's dated March 9th, 2021, uh, regarding the proposed updates and maintenance shed replacement. To whom it may concern, I have read the documents and the minutes regarding the proposed updates and improvements to the Quag Wildlife Refuge facilities and have discussed this as well with friends who regularly use the refuge and have a vested interest. It became important to me to respond to the commission as I too have a longstanding vested interest in not just the property, but also the mission and functioning of the refuge. Wildlife, Quag Wildlife Refuge is an outstanding functioning part of the greater East End community serves. It has remained an island refuge in our area and indeed students of West Hampton Beach High School have studied at it as such for more than the past three decades. Additional student groups I had the pleasure of serving, Cure or Classmates United in Restoring the Environment called, called this refuge their own and participated actively in fundraising for refuge and participating in activities for the refuge. Through these connections may point out the obvious, the importance of the refuge has grown and its ability to serve the community has become more vital than it ever was. The growth of, <clears throat> the, growth of the refuge has been something I've watched with great interest as my own children have grown and now my grandchildren in the appreciation and use of the facilities. The staff have made fantastic use of the grounds as a teaching tool while preserving and protecting the integrity of the refuge proper. Anything the community can do to support the refuge and the mission of its staff is I believe a priority and should be endorsed without reservation. The proposed improvements do not exceed the limitations of the law 
regulating protection of environmental integrity or habitat and in fact should be viewed on the lenses of encouraging the very activities that make this place and places like it the precious gems they are for generations to come. I do hope you will look favorably on the proposal and support the refuge in every way possible. The mission of the refuge and its importance will need your continued support and di diligence. Thank you. Sincerely, Joseph Comer. <clears throat> now I'd like to move on to, um, and I just wanna note that all the letters that we receive will be included and attached to the minutes that are prepared. And also the commission members have received copies of these letters as well. I'd like to now move on to public comments. Um, the first person we have for uh, public comments is the Honorable Brian Tymon, West Hampton Beach Village Board Trustee. Mr. Tymon. <clears throat> Let me see if I have his. I don't, do you see him? No, he may have written a letter, Judy. He did, but he had asked to speak to. I can read his letter. If he's not present, we could read his letter. All right. So we'll I'm here. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, now I lost you again. I'm sorry. No, this, is, uh, this is uh, Charles. We're not up to you yet on the agenda for Kent. Oh, okay. Because oh, I just I got a message to unmute myself. So that, that's why I, I did. Oh, okay. I guess they're doing that during gonna... the public comment portion. But we're actually, I'm looking for uh, Brian Tymon. There's no one listed with that name. All right, I can read his letter quickly. March, it's dated March 9th, 2021. Esteemed members of the Pine Barrens Commission, I write to you today to ask for your support. It would be difficult for me to accurately put into words just how important the Quag Wildlife Refuge is to me, my family, and my community and most importantly to the well-being of our natural environment. It serves a litany of purposes and functions from being a safe haven for abundance of flora and fauna to providing an educational form that cannot be matched. It is a retreat for individuals and families that connects them with nature in a world where we were surrounded and consumed by computers, phones, work and hustle. Over the past 40 years, I have been connected with the refuge. I have witnessed it evolve substantially and harmoniously with nature. The evolution has been entirely productive and without adverse impact on the ecological sensitivities of the property. Each of my two little girls have been part of dozens upon dozens of programs, classes, camps, events, hikes, seminars, birthday parties, and more over the six plus years at Quag Wildlife Refuge. It has been invaluable to their education, well-being development of respect and appreciation for the natural world. With these things in mind, I ask for the utmost discretion given to their application and the application of big picture thinking. While you have clear rules and regulations to follow, you also have clear powers to act subjectively. In fact, if objectively where the function of the commission would be made up of attorneys, your board, however, can and does consider each property unique in its makeup as, as well as its function and value to the community and the environment. And while you will never see two properties that are exactly the same, you will undoubtedly never see another property even similar to this. The uniqueness eliminates any concern of another applicant citing this approval as being applicable to themselves. I close by reiterating my strong, passionate request for you to weigh all the facts and unique aspects of this property and their application. While it exists within the Quarius, why does their designation follow their property lines? Certainly environmental designations do not know tax map numbers, so we need to think about why the refuge is designated as it is. 
for many reasons above the that emphasize the importance and stellar stewardship of the refuge combined with the actual evaluation of the impact or lack thereof or the proposed work it seems only logical that they be granted the permission that they seek thank you for your time your tireless service and your dedication to protecting our environment with kindness and thanks, Brian Time in West Hampton Beach, Village Trustee. So then the, um, the next uh, request that we receive to speak is from Richard Ampert, Long Island Pine Barren Society. Dick, are you present? Yes, I am. Okay, please go ahead. Um, well, after viewing, first of all, I would like this uh, put into the record as well. I did not know it would be limited to two minutes, so I will keep it to two minutes. But if you could just make copies available, that would be helpful to me. Absolutely. Um, after reviewing the agenda for the upcoming uh, March 17th meeting, it has come to our attention that both the Quag Wildlife Refuge and the Kent Animal Shelter will be up for discussion on what we assume um, is this a hardship or is it uh, a hardship application? that was required for these proposed projects. We would like to remind the commissioners that it is their sworn duty to look at the projects based on their compliance with the Pine Barrens Act and the Comprehensive Land Use Plan. Many applicants that have come before the commission perform important work, work that we can all support. It does not exempt them from the development guidelines. Commissioners must follow the clear rule book before them and not make their own decision based on whether or not they value the work of the applicant before them. In addition, commissioners should not be coaching applicants on how to maneuver their way around the Pine Barrens Act and look to find a loophole for approval. When the Quag Wildlife, Wildlife Refuge was last discussed at the December 2020 meeting, Commissioner Schneiderman was trying to inappropriately prompt the applicant into saying that their development project would be mostly be used for scouting activities so that a hardship application would not be required. The applicant seemed uncomfortable and so did the commission staff Commission staff had mentioned several times that a project of that size and magnitude would likely be considered development under the act and the club. However, the commissioners did not seem to be listening to this expert staff advice. Again, we'll shorten this to conform to the two minutes uh, requirements here. Um, the commission's review process has become a free for all that applicants have now adopted the approach to ask for anything they want to see what they can get Applicants from years ago are now coming forward. It's become, let's make a deal. Applicants know that their projects qualify as development, but see an opening with this current board of commissioners to get away with more than what is allowed. It's extremely alarming, and it is the antithesis of what the Pine Barrens Act is created to stop. These are not about individual projects, but also conformity with the Pine Barrens Act, which is being escaped of late. We support the work of these two noble organizations. We must insist that the Pine Barrens Act and CLUP guidelines be applied to each and every application that comes before the commission and the staff be involved in explaining this information and how it applies to the Pine Barrens uh, uh, law. Thank you, uh, Judy, appreciate it. Thank you. And um, thank you very much, Dick. Okay, so we are, we're going to move on to, oh, excuse me. Now we're going to open it up to other um, members of the public that are present via Zoom. Does anyone else want to speak? Please uh, select the raise your hand feature or enter your request into the chat feature. Kathy, do you see anybody? I don't see. We have anybody. nothing. Okay. All right. So then, do we have any people that have called in? No. Okay. All right. So seeing none, we will move on to item one B, the minutes for the February twenty fourth meeting. If we could get a motion to approve. We make a motion to approve the minutes as submitted. Thank you, Supervisor Remain. A uh, second. We've had seconds. Thank you, Dan. You're welcome. Okay, so the motion's uh, uh, passed. With both. No, Judy. What? Um, 
All in favor, please raise your oh, hand. Oh, excuse me, all in favor. Um, I'm gonna recuse myself as I was not present for the last meeting. Okay. So it'll be three, zero, one. Thank you. Thank you, Marty. Welcome. Okay. Thank you. All right, all in favor? Um, three. Opposed? Zero, one. It's three, zero, one, Judy. Okay, thank you. So uh, the motion's passed. Okay, we're gonna move on to the science and stewardship section. Um, the, we don't have a report um, right now for education and outreach, it's not available. Um, so we'll move on to the science and stewardship division, uh, Ms. Wiegand. Thank you, Judy. Um, so I wanted to start out with just recognizing uh, our ecological field specialist, Broderick DeAngelis um, has provided notice. Uh, and we will we have uh, put out a um, advertisement for uh, hiring and his replacement, but happy to share that he has uh, secured a position with the US Forest Service working in the coast of Oregon, uh, half an hour north of California as a, a botanical te technician, a botany technician. So we're very happy to help support him in his uh, professional growth and securing that uh, position. Um, it's actually a, a really difficult to get into the Forest Service and federal positions. So I wanna give him accolades on that and also recognize the time that he has put in here with the commission. Um, he has been uh, extremely valuable and, and really helped us continue to move the program forward um, and, and meet our goals and objectives. So he will be missed. Um, and his last day will be uh, March 29th. So um, moving on from that, we've been focused um, predominantly with uh, on the uh, prescribed fire program. We continue to have meetings with DEC uh, regarding planning and uh, operations for the spring season moving forward. We continue to submit our vouchers and our reports uh, for reimbursement to the state to ensure that water authority gets reimbursed in a timely fashion for the expenses they outlay related to the program. Uh, we have um, been working to put the prescribed uh, fire management plan up on our website and extend our education and outreach, uh, including creating a prescribed fire uh, website, uh, a, a pamphlet related to prescribed fire, a flyer that would be mailed out to homeowners around the vicinity where prescribed fires would be occurring and also uh, developing a, a video to help uh, expand the understanding and the importance of uh, prescribed fire for ecological benefits and also for public health improvement and wildfire risk reduction. So those things will be uh, coming forth soon. Um, we also um, are working on ramping up our social media postings uh, related to science and stewardship activities as well as um, prescribed fire uh, announcements and information for the public. So. Uh, those are things that we're looking forward to. Uh, you should be receiving an MOU for your review and approval, um, accompanying a resolution with that for an MOU with Brookhaven National Lab. We have that in final review um, this week. And then Bob and Sean have been working diligently on uh, finalizing some burn plans for the South of Kearns Woodlands. Um, Bob has gotten that through the DEC Region 1 review. It's now up at the central office for their final review. And hopefully we will be able to uh, put some fire on the ground um, you know, this year at that unit, which is in Rocky Point Pine Barren State Forest. And work is also continuing on developing a burn plan for the David Sarnoff Preserve um, as we speak. Both uh, Sean um, and Bob went out to meet with Nate Hudson from DEC to talk about um, some of the forest health uh, vegetation treatments that need to occur to facilitate uh, the prescribed fire. So we've been working with Nate not only um, at Sarnoff, but also at the South Occurrence to prepare the burn lines and additional vegetation treatments um, to facilitate prescribed fire um, at both of those areas uh, in the near future. And then the last thing related to prescribed fire is that we have participated in our required an annual wildfire refresher training, uh, including doing the online training this year um, instead of in person due to COVID, but also uh, completing our uh, physical uh, test, uh, our PAC test 
uh, which some of us did uh, on Monday, and then uh, Bob will be Bob and Gary will be doing on Saturday. So, other activities that we've been involved in is um, related to invasive species. Is Jane and Broderick just posted our uh, early detection rapid response um, trapping for non-native uh, bark beetles and ambrosia beetles in association with DEC and the U.S. Forest Service to um, detect new invaders that we may want to be concerned with depending on what is found and we've put those um, within uh, the forest in line uh, just adjacent to line road in, in Calverton and we're also working on uh, ramping up miscanthus management with DOT and PSENG in the towns as well so we've had meetings in that accord to help coordinate the removal of detected uh, escapes of the horticultural grass and then Jaden Broderick has been getting out in the field and hand digging um, the escapes uh, in the grasslands uh, owned by the DEC. And then two last things is that we continue to work on encroachment uh, restoration issues with the Attorney General's office and also in the field restorations and developing an RFP. And um, I and Sean were involved last week in giving a presentation called The Tale of Two Pine Barrens with the New Jersey Pinelands Commission to help uh, educate and inform uh, folks of the similarities and differences between the ecosystems and the protections associated with them. And I also gave a presentation on grassland restoration and considerations um, moving forward for um, you know, landowners and the uh, horticultural trade uh, for Cornell Cooperative Extension. So we've been doing uh, ample field work uh, as the season gears up and uh, doing a lot of planning and preparation for that. So does anyone have any questions? Yeah, just a question. Uh, as you know, there was a significant fire in uh, New Jersey this past weekend. Was that in the New Jersey Pinelands? And if so, what was the cause of that fire? I'm not sure, Marty. I just saw a fleeting reference to it. I didn't look at it further yet, um, oh. but I know that yeah, with there were quick quick reaction time with the New Jersey Forest Fire Service and the local fire departments were able to contain and suppress that fire rather quickly. But yeah, yeah but we're we're in active fire season right now, and Jerry's been sending out the uh, wildfire risk uh, announcements uh, via email. So. Yeah, it was uh, quite uh, surprising with the uh, high winds and the low humidity that they were able to put out the uh, fire so quickly. There was significant uh, concern out here. Um, I guess the weather forecast is for rain in the next couple of days. So that should uh, improve uh, conditions here considerably. Right, yeah, improve it for reducing the risk of wildfire. Yeah. But yeah, we're definitely concerned about um, low humidities and high winds as driving the fires. There were a number of brush fires that broke out this weekend. Uh, one I know of over in Bellport, I was driving past uh, that. So uh, there is a burn ban in effect uh, throughout New York State. I believe there's always a burn ban on Long Island, but you know, just being cognizant right now with um, any, you know, it means that could, create ignition, whether, um, you know, it's like pulling off on the side of the road in your catalytic converter to uh, cigarettes to, um, you know, having a little barbecue in the backyard is always a high risk in the spring for uh, a brush fire to develop. Because uh, his, historically, uh, March is uh, one of the times that we're at the greatest uh, risk of fire, correct? Right. Yes. Yeah, all the all the natural environment conditions align to drive the high risk of wildfire, so. All right, thank you. Yep. Janet, you had a question? No. Okay. Okay, anyone else? Okay. Great, and thank you very much. Thank you, Polly. All right, next item under science and stewardship, uh, Oh, excuse me, under planning land use and the Pine Barrens Credit Program 3A, the Compliance and Enforcement Division. You received their report in your e-packet. They're not present today to be able to update you directly, but please take the time to review their report that was provided to you previously. 
the next item, 3B, Land Use Division update, Ms. Hargrave. Thank you, good afternoon. Um, you have my report. Uh, there are a few hardship applications and requests um, listed. Kogel Brothers is a hardship application for a single family residence, but that is currently pending um, a closing uh, but has been delayed due to COVID at the state level. Um, the state is potentially acquiring that pro property. So we will see that again in May. That's the current um, time frame that they're supposed to come back and inform the commission on the status of that application. And of course, on the agenda today, you have um, Kent Animal Shelter and Quag Wildlife Refuge requests for uh, proposals on those properties and uh, Dallas Baranzo is on later, but it will be, uh, they're proposing to withdraw the application. And um, as far as we know, pursue a carriage house option to um, accommodate their, their needs on their property rather than a subdivision. And uh, we continue to receive inquiries and referrals from the towns and uh, monitor uh, restoration and um, revegetation plans that result from either hardships or potential uh, violations of hardship permits in the compatible growth area and the uh, core preservation area, or sometimes where there were not um, um, hardships granted. And long term projects of involvement in the Peconic Estuary Partnership and um, which is, and another thing which is on your agenda today, their USGS monitoring program, and um, eventually hoping to get to the plan amendments to you again in the near future. So uh, does anyone have any questions on my report? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Julie. Okay, item 3C, credit program update, Mr. Tiberti. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm just going to give you a brief update on the uh, credit program activities. Uh, so we keep receiving a letter of interpretation applications. So far this year, uh, we have issued 19 uh, LOIs, three in the town of Brookhaven, uh, one in Riverhead, and uh, majority 15 in the town of Southampton. We have 10 uh, uh, conservation easements that are currently in the process. Um, recently, 41.6 credits have been redeemed um, and uh, they were not reflect reflected in the table um, because uh, we, we have just received the certificate uh, recently last Friday. It is for a big project uh, in Brookhaven Town, the Arboretum at Farmingville, for a zone change from a residential A1 to multifamily and from business J4 to J2 district. Um, this is the record number of credits that have been redeemed for one project so far. Uh, the closest number uh, to that was 26 credits back in uh, 2014. Uh, 1.25 credits have been sold in Brookhaven town uh, with an average price of uh, 94,000 per credit. Uh, one credit in the river had for 60 and a half thousand and one credit in Southampton for uh, one, one of 4,000. Uh, the total average price for 2021 uh, so far is 87,000 uh, per credit. Uh, so this, the spring is coming and so far, um, so we are planning to restart our conservation easement monitoring visits and keep up with an easement science installation. Um, the cleaner house still own 10.19 credits. There is uh, two and a half million in the bank and the interest build up uh, for the last two months was uh, just $400. And lastly, we have a Harriet Murphy credit appeal decision 
that is due today. Uh, that's all I have. If you have any questions. No questions? Okay, thank you, Jerry. Thank you. Okay, next on the agenda under item 3D is the USGS Water Resource Monitoring Annual Update. Uh, we're going to receive a presentation. Julie, did you have anything to say initially? Thank you. I just wanted to introduce them. Um, the, and remind everyone that in 2017, the commission entered into a five-year agreement with USGS to study water resources, groundwater and surface water in the Central Pine Barrens. And there's a requirement for an annual update, uh, an annual report to the commission on the progress of that study. And so USGS is here today, Irene Fisher, the hydrogeologist leading this and managing this project. And um, maybe uh, her, also the a Amy Simonson from USGS may also be on to yeah. present that. So. I'll let Irene Fisher um, just, thank you. Hi, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen. I, I am on and I'm gonna acknowledge uh, Banu Bayra Qatar and Amy Simonson, yes, are a part of this project. Um, Amy is online, um, but may not be able to answer questions with audio at this moment, so, um, but she's here. So she, we can answer some questions. I'm gonna share the screen now. Okay. And Okay. Okay, so thank you for the introduction. Um, let's make sure I can move this up. Okay, so as Julie mentioned, yep, this is a five year monitoring program. And the main goal objective of this was to expand and operate a comprehensive water resource monitoring program for the Central Pine Barrens. Uh, all the data are publicly accessible in a database and it includes all the hydrologic conditions for surface water, groundwater, and all the water quality data. And as far as the baseline, you know, you know, Long Island is continually experiencing changes within the environment and it's related to development. So over the last 50 years, the Pine Barrens in particular has moved more from a, like a rural environment to a more suburban environment. And defining this current baseline is helpful to distinguish the effectiveness of the Pine Barrens resource management and conservation efforts, you know, for tomorrow and for, you know, as any other um, assessing any hydrologic changes and trends um, we may need to do in the future. Uh, this is also providing a data resource to monitor the eco-hydrologic eco stress, which so that's you know looking at the relationship between the water resource and the ecology, so all the environment um, and the organisms pres present in the environment. This is a picture right now outlining all of, or a map of all of the sites that we're currently monitoring. This is a, a cooperative effort, not only between the Central Pine Barrens Commission and the town of Brookhaven, uh, this also includes some um, cooperation with Suffolk County Water Authority and Suffolk County Department of Health Services. All the little orange circles, those are our groundwater monitoring locations and the uh, blue diamonds are the uh, stream locations that we're monitoring. That large yellow triangle is a continuous groundwater site that the Pine Barrens Commission is currently supporting. So um, as long as far as we, to let you know here we have on the water quality, there are two locations along the pines on the Peconic River, and there are five locations along the Carmen's River. The Pine Barrens Commission is supporting five of these monthly groundwater levels on, an annu on, on a monthly basis. So currently our project timeline, as Julie mentioned to you, yeah, we began this in October, 2017. It runs through September, 2022. We're currently in the third year of our data collection. And um, just to give you an idea then too, what we consider a year is our water year runs from October to the following September. And um, right now we've already, we've released uh, 2018 and a 2019 data release. And that's all the data that we had collected in support of this particular project. Those are available on our website. The 2020 data are currently in review and we expect that to be available for download 
um, by early summer. As the data do become available, they are present in our NWIS database. This data release, what it does is kind of captures all of the data and puts it in one location for um, easier access. After the data collection, um, we are expecting to put together an uh, interpretive report and we figure that will be done um, sometime winter 2023 after the fifth year of data collection. Okay, so data collection during the pandemic, we didn't miss any of the water quality samples um, that we were expecting. We happen to have gotten the winter sample done prior to the shutdown last March. And then we were able to get back out into the field um, for the, the spring sampling. The water quantity end, island-wide, we missed all of our monthly measurements in April 2020. In April, we tend to, um, that, that's, our, that's the time frame that we do our annual synoptic when we take a snapshot of every single well that we're monitoring across the island. So we did move that to October instead this year. And we are using the October one as um, it's gonna be considered our stress synoptic. So it's going to be capturing the water levels um, after the summer usage. Or that's of the water table. Recorders did continue to collect data during April. And so we did not skip a beat with any of those data collections. We just ended up having to download them when we were able to get back out into the field and um, release those to the public as well. I'm going to start with the water quality monitoring that we've done. So the objectives, just to remind you here, that's again, it's to develop a baseline chemistry for the streams. And with that particular, uh, you know, with the data collection, we're using that to determine the influence of anthropogenic um, sources on the uh, water quality in the area. The methods that we're using on these samples that we're collecting is an, an um, analysis of nutrients, so of all the species of nitrogen, total nitrogen, and phosphorus. We're looking at inorganics, the major and trace elements. Uh, pesticide analysis, when we're doing those, that's including 200 plus different types of pesticides. So that's going to be your fungicides, your herbicides, um, and uh, what did I miss one? Uh, insecticides. And it's also including um, many integrated products of those particular pesticides. And the pharmaceutical list is over 100, and that's including prescription and over the counter drugs. Right, just to focus a little bit more now on the Carmen's River here. There are five locations along the river, starting with Bartlett to the north, Upper Lake, Lower Lake, the Carmen's River Gauge, and then a tidal location that's located just south of Sunrise Highway. We visit these sites up to four times a year. Um, that's on a seasonal basis, winter, spring, summer, fall. The sample location and the frequency of the sampling was decided upon after reviewing the Carmen's River um, management plan. Each time we go and visit these sites, we're collecting samples for analysis to, um, for nutrients and organics and the physical parameters. And that, that's your pH, dissolved oxygen, water temperature, turbidity, um, and specific conductance. Uh, organic sampling for the pharmaceuticals and the pesticide, that's once a year, and that alternates during the fall or the spring. And we're only collecting those at one location along the river, and that is at the Carmen's River Gauge. For the Peconic River, we have two locations. It's upstream at Connecticut Avenue and downstream at Peconic Gauge, which is uh, um, downtown uh, near the uh, snowflakes and the pizza shop in that area. We monitor here twice a year in the spring and the fall. And again, every time we go to visit, we're looking at nutrients and organics and those physical parameters. And the same goes with the pharmaceuticals and the pesticides as we're doing on the Carmens. Um, it's except that we are looking at upstream and downstream for each one of these organic constituents. All right, so just this table is giving you a summary of the types of detect and number of detections that we're finding for pharmaceuticals and pesticides in uh, the samples. So on the left-hand side, you know, it's representing, you know, we have um, data for three seasons here. We have fall 2017, spring 2019, and fall 2019. The stream is in the middle. So the Carmen's River again, at the gauge, and then that, there are two for the Peconic River. You have upstream and then Peconic River downstream. 
The middle column is the pharmaceutical count. So those are the number of detections. And then on the right is the pesticide. So this is just kind of the table demonstrates the variability in detections during the base flow conditions by the season. I want to add here now that um, we just recently added the Nisiquag River to our sampling um, monitoring network. So we do we think that's going to give us a nice, um, you know, a comparison of what stream water quality would be in a more urban environment for Long Island. Um, and then also down here, I have that the next collection is scheduled for spring 2021. So that'll be like around May or June. The Nisiquag River is also following the same sampling frequency as uh, we are doing here in the Pine Barrens. This is looking at the, um, this is Carmen's River data and it's total nitrogen, the filtered um, analysis of it, and it's milligrams per liter as nitrogen. So total nitrogen, all the nitrogen species, organic and inorganic nitrogen. And it's just for one water year. It starts from fall 2019, and these are samples that represent up to summer 2020. On the left-hand side, I have the concentration. It goes anywhere from 0.1, it's at a logarithmic scale. So it's 0.1 with middle being one milligram per liter. And at the top, it's the 10 milligrams per liter. Down on the bottom part, it has, has a point at which where we're sampling along the river. So it goes in downstream order from Bartlett all the way down to the tidal portion. Fall samples are represented by purple, um, excuse me, by brown circles. The winter samples are open white circles. The gray triangles is spring and blue triangles are the summer 2020 um, samples that were collected in either August or September of this past year. Uh, so, you know, what we're looking at here is just that, you know, we can't make a huge distinction here, but for the most part, most of the river, the concentration in total nitrogen is hovering right around one milligram per liter. And we see more variability um, at the Bartlett stream um, monitoring location, but that shouldn't be too surprising given where we're sampling for, um, where we're taking our samples, which is right off the Bartlett road there near Cathedral Pines. And it, there is a lot of them. It's at the closest to the headwaters, it's most groundwater influenced and um, it's, right off the road in that location. I'm going to move into the water quantity now. On the left hand side, we have a map of New York um, with the, the percentage departure from normal precipitation during the month of February. So in green, those are going to be areas that are seeing um, a higher than average precipitation for the month, uh, just for February 2021. On the right hand side is the US stream flow data during 2021. The rankings are based on historical or normal conditions. And if you look down there on the right hand side, it says, you know, for the most part, it looks like Long Island is in the normal range, which is green. Okay. These two graphs are the Carmen's and Peconic hydrographs. Starting period of, um, period of discharge is 2018 through 2021. Now again, we're looking at stream, the, the gauges here. And the black line in between both of them are representing the current discharge. The percentiles are very similar to what we saw in the groundwater, where green would be your, your normal range and blue is gonna be your much above normal and brown is gonna be much below normal. So both of them are in the normal range, but do you have to stress here that it's kind of in a, a lower portion of the normal range. This one here, this map is a, a map of the active groundwater monitoring sites within the Pine Barrens area. Um, it's the same ranking criteria as the surface water again. The symbols shaded in gray are not ranked because the period of record is not long enough for statistical analysis. Um, and then many of these po points here are, are green, which is normal, um, considered normal conditions. And some of the locations are orange and red, indicating that some of the areas throughout Pond Barrens are still below normal. 
Overall, while the data suggests that we are in normal conditions, it is still, like I said, at a lower normal level. And this is our continuous water, um, water level monitoring gauge. It's located in Middle Island near Artis Lake. And this one is being monitored because it's uh, the closest we have to um, trying to understand um, start of flow for the Carmen's River. The middle graph is period of record. If you look down there on the bottom of the, um, of the, X, the um, X axis there, it starts 06. That's for year 2006. And the data runs until now. And the blue line is representative of the uh, water level elevation above um, sea level. On the right hand side, that's our continuous data for the last year. It starts April and that's April 2020 and it runs to um, March 2021. That's what the red line data would be um, connecting there. Those are the continuous readings. So you can see here that same percentiles, um, the levels here show that we're just below normal in this area. All right, to wrap it up, it's, um, it's, uh, Julie mentioned that this presentation is one of our deliverables for the project. Um, and we also are providing um, on the, our project webpage, there is an overview of the project and we do put, post our updates there. Uh, we also are having this annual data summary, which is the data release, and those are also available on the project webpage. You can type in usgs.gov forward slash Long Island Pine Barrens or use your favorite search engine and type in USGS Pine Barrens. And the first thing that pops up should be our project webpage. Oh. Just want to say a thank you out to all the cooperators, including Central Pine Barrens Commission in the town of Brookhaven, which most of the data that they are directly supporting was uh, focused on today's presentation, but a lot of the collection efforts that we are able to show you and do compare and contrast on the conditions for you know, any hydrologic conditions, water quality or water quantity across the Long Island, you know, is possible because of the cooperation of all these other groups. And I'll leave you with that. That is our webpage again. And then if you have questions that you wanna follow up on, those are our email addresses. Are there any questions? Yeah, Irene, uh, notwithstanding high uh, precipitation uh, rates for the last uh, few years and the near normal groundwater levels, are we technically in a drought watch? And if so, what is the long-term forecast in terms of a return to normal groundwater levels? Let's see, I think maybe is Ron Bushlano? Yeah, Irene, I am here. Yeah, so this is Ron Bushlano at the USGS. So, um, you know, what Irene showed on the, uh, on the, on the uh, display uh, earlier about the, yeah, here it is, yeah, about the, the precipitation. Um, so this is showing what was going on in March. Uh, prior to that, uh, the years of 2017, 16 and 15, we were in a, a pretty deep drought. <laughs> Um, during that time, you know, water levels were very low in East End and actually near record low and some hit record lows. Uh, since then, we've come back somewhat. And as Irene mentioned, you know, we're sort of in a low normal level right now. Um, currently, we're not in, not in any drought watch, but over the past um, few weeks, we really haven't had any rain at all. Uh, just a few scattered showers here and there. So it has been very dry since this chart was, was set up, you know, for the month of February. Um, hopefully, we'll be getting some heavier rain coming up in the, in the near future as well. But, you know, when we're looking at stream flow on, on the, uh, the rivers, the local rivers, you know, we see that right now we're currently at the, the normal to below normal range. And we expect, I think, um, you know, for the rest of the winter that we'll start seeing some rebound. That's what we usually say, see in the winter and the fall in stream flow. But that's all dependent on the amount of precip we're going to get over the next few months. So, so we'll see where we fall once you know, once we get into the, uh, you know, early part of the spring. Uh, but, you know, I would say we're in pretty good shape right now, but we got to keep an eye on, you know, what's going on with the precipitation over the next couple of months. All right. Thank you. Yep. Is there any other questions? Dogs howling in the background. 
apologies. Sorry. <laughs> I said your door. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was a great presentation. And, I, and as usual, we really appreciate all of the efforts of the USGS folks in, in this uh, program that we're cooperating with. So thank you again. You're welcome, thank you. So now we're on to item 3E under the core preservation area, Quag Wildlife Refuge request for determination of jurisdiction, three old country road, Quag, expansion of the nature center and construction of a 2,700 square foot barn uh, determination, Ms. Hargrave. Thank you again. Um, so just to uh, give a brief introduction and explain where we are now and um, what has happened to date. So the Quag Wildlife Refuge, you know, is approximately 305 acres in the village of Quag and the town of Southampton in the core preservation area. And in December, the refuge submitted a request for determination for three projects. One is the replacement and upgrade of their sanitary system. The second, the expansion of the nature center. And the third, the construction of a 2,700 square foot maintenance storage barn. In December, the commission determined the sanitary system was non-development, the nature center was development and the barn was exempt. In January, the commission adopted a resolution that the nature center expansion is development and requires submission of a core hardship application. Um, the commission confirmed- And the barn? Excuse me? And the barn? The barn, the commission invited the applicant to return to address the barn and um, they were instructed to not commence work on the barn and the applicant said they would not move forward unless approved or authorized by the commission that this was just the first step in researching whether these projects could move forward and uh, this was an exploratory request. So the barn, again, the um, commission, the commission offered the, that the applicant could come back and explain um, that uh, whatever they wanted to present to the commission on their um, arguments on the barn as non-development. But again, it's clear that the commission passed a resolution in January that the expansion of the nature center is development. And then they're here today to present to you um, their arguments for the barn and whether that is development or non-development. But uh, the commission did say, I just wanted to say, add that the commission did say in January that that barn is on the path to be development, to be determined to be development. So they were um, placed on notice at that time. So the I think the applicant is here, uh, Mr. Nelson, and there are at least, uh, one or two attorneys from the firm Nelson, um, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Troutman. Troutman Pepper. Yeah. Troutman Pepper. Andrew Perrell and Buck Dixon, right? Yes, that, okay. that's correct. Thank you, Ms. Hargrave. I'm, I'm Andrew Perrell, a uh, partner with Troutman Pepper, formerly Troutman Sanders. Uh, we do represent the Quag Wildlife Refuge. I am gonna introduce Buck Dixon, yield the floor to Buck. He's an associate with the firm who is fully prepared to address the, the committee and uh, hopefully uh, provide the necessary information. Buck. Hi everyone, and I'm looking here, I'm trying to turn my video on, but uh, it says I'm, oh, there we go. Okay, uh, good afternoon everyone, uh, members of the commission, uh, Director Jacobson and, and others. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, a couple of things um, about the comments that were just made. First off, in the December meeting, there was no determination that, that the uh, Nature Center expansion was development. Uh, in fact, uh, Mr. Romain at the end of the meeting uh, asked for a formal resolution finding that the first two items, which were the septic system and the barn storage area, uh, be considered non-development and that the decision on the third item, the Nature Center building expansion, be saved for a later date. Uh, in response to that, um, then director uh, stated that, quote, being consistent with prior non-development determinations, the commission traditionally hasn't adopted formal resolutions. So if it's consistent with non-development, then there's basically agreement in that regard, end quote. 
Um, in response to that statement, um, several of the members of the commission affirmatively stated that they agree with that approach. Uh, and later uh, on December 16th, 2020, Ms. Hargrave confirmed that decision uh, in an email to uh, the Wildlife Res Refuge when she said that the commission determined the upgrade to the sanitary system and the construction of a barn is non-development. Um, she also said that the, uh, that the refuge will be receiving a letter to that same effect, but uh, one was never sent. Uh, it was not until uh, the refuge received the agenda for the January meeting, um, which they received on January 12th, where they noticed that uh, all three items were placed back on the agenda. At that time, uh, the refuge reached out uh, to Ms. Hargrave and, um, and, and asked basically why uh, the first two items were on the agenda. Uh, and in response, she said, quote, there may be a discussion about the barn because of its size. There was some concern expressed about it from the commission's council who was not present at the meeting. Uh, during the meeting, um, there was a discussion about how there was an informal consensus uh, reached about the septic system and the barn. Uh, and given the uh, statement by the then director, um, that, is, that, that consensus is consistent with, with how uh, the commission has acted on such uh, non-development determinations in the past uh, based on that statement again. Um, so I would, I would uh, put to you that the inaction of taking uh, uh, a, a formal vote on that is in itself action in that part. Uh, and that action is, is uh, something that um, the refuge had detrimentally relied upon uh, between December 16th and January 12th. Uh, they expended significant staff resources and, and the preparation for building this, the structure. Um, and again, that was to their uh, detriment. Uh, and it was not until they were put on notice by, uh, by the agenda item that they, were, that they heard anything otherwise. Um, so that's from a procedural standpoint, I just wanted to make those points. Um, from, from a legal standpoint, however, uh, we believe that the, well, the refuge believes, and, and I do as well, that, um, that the barn project um, should be considered non-development. Um, and, and the reasons for that are as follows. First, um, this is an accessory to a residential structure. Uh, this, this storage area is located approximately 100 feet from Mr. Nelson's doorstep, where he lives. He is going to be using this structure for his personal use in addition to use by the refuge. Um, there's nothing in the act that says that uh, something must be used exclusively for residential purposes. Uh, but it is undeniable that, uh, that this structure will be used um, by Mr. Nelson uh, as part as, an, as, as part of, of his residence. Um, I'd like to, just to make that point clear. Um, secondly, the, the area where the barn is located uh, is in a residential zone, A9. Um, and there's nothing, also there was reference to the uh, size of the barn in the email. There's nothing in the, in the law that places any sort of size limit uh, on the size of an accessory to a residence. Um, and we would also like to point out too, that if it's determined that, I, I guess the, um, the, the concern, one of the concerns that we have here is that under the law, it could potentially, uh, a single family home residence could potentially be approved on this same property as non-development, but this ancillary structure would be considered development despite the fact that it has a smaller environmental impact um, despite the fact that the refuge is placing it in a place uh, where it's going to have the least detriment to the environment, um, they place it in an area where only a couple of trees, um, and Mr. Nelson can uh, confirm that, um, are going to be impacted. Um, but in any event, we believe that the law, uh, that, the, that the statute is on the refuge's side here. Um, and Again, inexplicably, there was a determination made that this was a commercial structure, despite the fact that it is an accessory to a residence. Uh, it's in an area that's zoned for uh, four residences. And um, that's really the, the primary argument here uh, for why the barn uh, 
is, is considered a residential structure. And again, in the December meeting, um, it was broad consistent consensus. Quote, I think the first and second requests are absolutely something we should approve as non-development. The first and second request should be immediately approved. The second proposal is to construct a barn for storage for the re residents in the refuge. And that's an accessory structure for residents and that's typically non-development. Um, it was a very clear consensus during that meeting. Um, it's, it's unclear as to why uh, minds changed uh, during the month thereafter. Um, but again, we would um, appreciate a determination that this is non-development. We think it fits squarely within uh, the exemption and um, we're happy to take any questions. Yeah, we'll okay. Second one. Yes, I have a question. Yes, sir. Um, your argument essentially that the barn is non-development, 2,700 square foot building is non-development is because an accessory use to a residential structure. Is that the crux of your argument? Um, well, to an extent, yes. Is the that crux the crux of, of your argument? Do you have another argument or is that the crux of it? The crux of our argument is that this, that, that the construction of this, uh, of this structure is directly in line with, with the statute itself and the exemption that's provided by the law as an accessory to a residence, yes. So you're making the argument that because it's an accessory to a residential structure, it should be considered non-development, despite the fact it's 2,700 feet uh, in size. Yes, sir. There's no there's no um, size threshold uh, in the law. Um, this is this is um, we believe it's within the plain meaning of the exemption that's provided by the law, um, and we think that it's well within the commission uh, commission's rights to um, to approve this as non-development. Okay. I, I've got to tell you that that, that doesn't that is not a convincing argument to me because I know it's going to be used primarily by the Nature Center. And I know, and I think the Nature Center does a wonderful job, but the bottom line is this may under the law, and you know, forgive me, I'm not a lawyer, but this may constitute development. And they have an opportunity to present a hardship application if that is in fact the case. But I am concerned because you're making this argument that the reason we should consider it non-development is because the guy that is employed by the Quad Wildlife who lives there is going to use this exclusively as part of his residential structure. And that's an argument that quite frankly, I don't fully buy. Well, sir, I, um, I, I understand that, that concern. I will say though, um, it, we never said that it would be used exclusively for residential use. Um, with that being said, we are within, um, we are within the, you know, the confines of the law here. Um, it's, it's defined as non-development and um, with all of due respect, sir, we, I mean, you, you thought so as well in the December meeting um, and um, we're just a little concerned as to the, to the change of, 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 of heart here on this, especially since um, we, that since the refuge relied upon that decision um, and this reversal, of course, set, does set a concerning precedent. Um, if there, if the argument is going to be that there's an informal consensus here then that puts at risk everyone who has a non-development determination. It puts them at risk of having the commission change its mind at any point. Um, and if they do detrimentally rely on that, then that places them in a, in a difficult position. So um, th that is the argument, sir. And, and, and we believe again, that it's within, within um, well within the confines of the exemption. Uh, and we would also uh, confirm that there's not for this particular exemption there's not a size threshold. Um, so that's, yeah, that's all I have to say on it. Thank you. I'll, I'll, we obviously, uh, the commission will meet at some point, uh, probably with its counsel and seek uh, legal, legal guidance from our, our, our wise and, and capable counsel. Yes, sir. Do any other members have any questions? Yeah, just a question uh, regarding the uh, plan reconstruction of the uh, barn. Um, can the barn be repaired or it's in such a deteriorated state that it needs to be replaced? Um, I'll, I'll let Mr. Nelson, who's the executive director of the refuge, speak to this more. But the, the barn currently does not exist. Um, it is currently they have 
currently they have um, temporary structures that are being used for storage. And Mr. So Nelson, there is no barn. There is no barn right now. Right. This is no a barn. new barn, new building. New building, new barn, new development. Okay, totally no. All right, thank you. What, I'm, I'm sorry, Judy, I just have one question for Mr. Dixon. Um, yes. What section of law are you referring to? Let me pull it here. It's um, the development exemption for, um, it's under 13, uh, forgive me for looking away from the screen. Um, That's fine. It is uh, 13 um, Roman numeral 10 in the core preservation area, construction of one single family home and customary accessory uses thereto on those parcels identified in the comprehensive land use plan adopted by the commission, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, can you read this so on and so forth? In the commission of, in June of 1995 as amended on February 21st, 2001. Okay, could you read the whole section this time? In the core preservation- Does it include the parcels? Is this parcel on the list? Is this on the list that's incorporated into the plan? Um, I, I don't sorry. know offhand, sir. Oh. You may want to check. You want me to, the answer, it's not. Well, it's not I do on know that, that list. Well, I do know that it, it, it is a zone in A9. No, no, that's not my question. I'm, my question was, is it on the list? Julie, is it on the list? No. Okay. No. So that provision, is there another provision that would apply? I hate to put you on the spot. I just, I just make That's sure. Right. I, no, I appreciate the question. I appreciate the question. Well, I, I, certainly that this was the, um, the primary uh, exemption that we were looking at, um, but we would also point out, um, and this was another argument to be presented on, on the other agenda item, but um, the Nature Center um, and its ancillary pieces here, um, are they are structures that are owned by associations that are formed for the common interest in real property. So we do believe that there's a potential here, given the given the the mission of the refuge, to uh, which is uh, public facing, and it's, it's seeking to provide um, services to the public. We believe that there is potential here, um, but again, it we the, the primary uh, concern or the primary exemption that we were um, addressing here was the accessory structure, and that was based primarily on the discussion that was presented. Um, during the December meeting. Um, and uh, there was, again, broad consensus at that time uh, that this was, uh, should be considered non-development. Um, and again, there was detrimental reliance on that decision by this commission. Um, so that's, that, that's a primary concern here. But, um, uh, but, but uh, just a comment, but how, how can you ignore that the uh, primary use of the refuge is non-residential. I mean, there may be a pre-existing residence on the property, but the primary use of this property is non-residential. Uh, that, sir, that, with all due respect, that may be the case, but um, there is no there's no discussion about the primary use uh, of, a, of a portion of the property. Um, it, it is not an exclusive, um, uh, use type thing, and, and further, again, I will, I will, I will go back to the fact that this commission did make a decision on on this particular item, uh, and it was approved by the members, uh, and, and my client detrimentally relied on on that decision to move forward. Um, we understand that there is obviously there's some um, discussion to be had as to whether or not um, the law particularly applies in this case. But regardless of that, uh, it, it does highlight the fact that even if the law does not apply, the commission um, inappropriately applied the law when it, when it, when it uh, initially said that this is non-development. 
and my client detrimentally relied on that information, which was until now, um, there was no reason given for that denial, um, other than saying without explanation that it's quote commercial. If I may add, this is Michael Nelson from the Quag Wildlife Refuge. Um, uh, earlier, the discussion was, uh, you know, if there's anything that exists on that parcel right now, and there is, um, as we stated, there is a, a small barn and other temporary shed shelters uh, that have exceeded their lifespan. Uh, it's nothing that is, um, uh, they're, you know, they're smaller um, 12 by 25 structures. Um, so we would remove those structures and create one, um, one structure, um, you know, to to replace that those existing ones. When did those structures get built? Uh, one of them uh, has been there before. Uh, you know, over a hundred years now, I would imagine when the house was, was built. Uh, the others are temporary sheds that were, um, were placed on, on uh, cinder blocks. Um, and again, I, you know, before I was director here um, and then uh, the tent shelters, um, I would imagine are probably at a 20 year uh, lifespan right now, so. When did you become director? In 2000. Does anyone else have any questions? Okay. Um, at this point, John, how should we move forward? It's up to the commissioner, of course, and I appreciate Mr. Dixon, Mr. Farrell. I know you reached out to Mr. Farrell reached out to us on Friday. Enjoyed our conversation, Mr. Dixon. Um, thanks for. I think you came up for this, so welcome to Long Island. I hope you've had a good time, um, and I think that um, it's up to the commission. We, you know, just to clarify, in January we invited the the Quag people, the Quag group, to come back. They're represented by able counsel, needless to say, um, to make the presentation just so that they had the opportunity to be heard on that um, sort of position that the, the barn is development or likely to be development or may not squarely fit into one of the exemptions. Um, so we wanted to give them notice and opportunity to be heard, of course. You know, just to set the context here, this is about whether something's development or not. It's not a determination. You can't, uh, an applicant, if it's development, cannot proceed. It just means it's a process question. They have to come back and make a hardship. Um, this happens all the time. You hear them all the time and you know most of them have been granted over time. So that's what the threshold determination is. And it's, a, it's an important matter for the commission to get those decisions right. So, um, and that's why we wanted to hear from them just to make sure everyone had the opportunity to be heard before a decision was reversed. So they had a process in place to give their thoughts and considerations. Um, I defer if the commission needs some uh, attorney client privilege communication, we would do that in the form of a closed advisory session. If the commission is ready to take the position that these projects, uh, so let me set up the framework, sanitary system, additions to a, a nature center and a barn. Sanitary system has not been in dispute. It's been deemed to be non-development from day one. The reading of the minutes from the December meeting were, um, you, know, you could argue that they read that the, the, the building was, the, the nature center was development and they passed a resolution to that effect in January. In January, you said the resolution adopted by the commission was that the, the nature center addition was development needed a hardship. And in January, we invited them back to, to discuss the barn. So um, if the commission is inclined to say that the nature center consistent with your January decision is still development needs a hardship, 
and that the barn, after hearing from the uh, Quag and its, and its attorneys, is in fact development. Um, they can make that resolution now. If you want to talk about it, um, we can, however you wish to proceed. Well, uh, well the town of Southampton is uh, highly uh, supportive of the work that the uh, Quag uh, refuge uh, does, which is a great benefit uh, to all of us. Uh, the town believes that the both the expansion of the uh, refuge building and the construction of the barn should be deemed development and that a hardship uh, exemption application should be filed. Does and Julie I'll, have uh, something written on this? We, we do not have a- um, Mr. Dixon, we will get you. I see you. Thank you. Yep. We, we don't have a draft to give you today, but we could bring it back uh, next month or we can we could formulate one um, to your- um, and, We could do a resolution uh, on the record. Yeah. Right. Well, based on the town of Southampton, where, where Quag is, is a refuge is located, indicating their view on that. Um, does the representative from Southampton wish to put something forward in the form of a resolution? Uh, yes, I'm uh, prepared to uh, make a motion uh, deeming the proposed construction of the barn and uh, development and reconfirming that uh, the additions to the uh, refuge center also uh, constitute uh, development and accordingly, a hardship exemption application should be filed. Is there a second? Director Jacobson. I'll second Southampton. Did Supervisor Aguiar, was that your second? Yes, no? I thought I saw her raise your hand. <laughs> I'm sorry. I think I think River had seconded. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Mr. Dixon, we'll get to you. Thank before you we so vote, much. Mr. Dixon did raise his hand before Marty fashioned a resolution so we could hear from him, I'm sorry. Thank, uh, thank you very much. Uh, and again, thank you for um, allowing me the time to speak with you today. Um, before, uh, I did have a number of comments um, on, on the proposed Nature Center expansion um, based on a review of the, uh, previous, uh, the previous two commission meetings and was hoping to provide a, 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 some clarity on a couple of, of, of issues that were discussed there uh, before there's a motion taken on, on that particular item as well. We will, um, because you, you came up for this, we'll of course in, in, indulge you. Typically we would not hear from an applicant after a motion in a second, but you did have your hand raised and we did wanna provide process to your client so that there could be no consideration that you didn't have the opportunity to be heard. So with that. Um, and and, and I'll you. be brief. Thank you. Okay. And I'll be brief. Um, first off, um, there was a lot of discussion in the last two meetings about um, recreational use and uh, in the context of scouting activities. Um, I'd like to point out that the that the exemption itself um, is, is not exclusive to scouting activities. It includes scouting activities. And while, while the scouts do great work, um, they do not have a monopoly on, on recreational use. Um, and the entire, the, the refuge's entire mission uh, revolves around getting folks outdoors, educating them on important issues about the environment. Uh, and we believe that everything they do falls squarely within uh, recreational use. Um, with that being said, um, there was also a bit of confusion about the size of this expansion. Uh, we're looking at a 960 square foot area. That's a, about 30 by 30. Um, and that's on the first floor. The second floor portion of the building is existing space. It's gonna be renovated. It's, gonna, it's a renovated attic to allow it to be more accessible to store things that are part of the recreational use of, uh, of the refuge and the nature center building. Um, so again, I just uh, would, would like, would, would contend that uh, recreational use is not limited to those activities uh, by the scouts. It certainly includes that, uh, but recreation, recreational use is not exclusive to scouting activities. And again, we believe based on that, we believe that this falls squarely within um, 
within the recreational use exemption for development. Uh, and, and further on that, um, a couple of years ago, um, a non-development determination was made when a, uh, a deck was built on uh, the Nature Center building, and it was based on the same exemption at the time uh, for recreational use. So we would contend that this is also recreational use. And again, the footprint of this uh, expansion is, is, is not uh, relatively large. Um, it's being, uh, the, the refuge is doing it in a manner to limit environmental impact. Um, there are, again, two or three trees that will be affected by this. Uh, it's being constructed on the portion of the building that is furthest away from any water body. Um, and again, it would be um, beneficial to have the non-development determination on this. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dixon. Any further discussion? Okay. I would take a vote. All in favor, please raise your hand. One, two, Riverhead. So, um, so that's four in favor. Three. Any opposed? No, that's only four. I know, there's <laughs> only four. So we'll do four, zero. Um, the motion's passed with a four zero vote. So, so this will be our, um, this will be the, the decision will be in the minutes and there won't be a, a separate written. So it's just a jurisdictional decision um, and Julie Hargrave can work with um, the applicant. If attorneys need to speak with the commission, please direct those calls to me and, um, and that's fine. And uh, we'll go from there. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time, everyone. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going on to the next uh, agenda item under uh, 3F, Vincent De La Speranza core hardship application in Northampton, subdivision of 1.8 acres in R15 zoning district for this existing single family residence. Julie? Oh, Judy, I think you skipped over 3F to Kent, Kent. But if you want to go to, to Dallas Speranza, that's just to acknowledge that the applicant is with no, I have S 3F. I have Vincent as 3F and then Ken and will show them. 3G. Okay. Yeah, I, I just got to do the, do, Dallas Speranza. Okay. okay. So, um, Dallas Speranza is being withdrawn. Um, the applicant is withdrawing that application. So if, if the commission could... Um, accept that withdrawal and um, you know if you have to make a motion to do that but make a motion to accept the withdrawal that would be the motion I, I make a motion to accept the withdrawal for, by the applicant I'll second Lorenzo. thank right. you second by um, Marty all in favor please raise your hand one two three four four zero the motion passed Okay, the next item under 3G is can animal shelter request for determination of jurisdiction to renovate and reconstruct, <clears throat> excuse me, reconstruct existing structures and replace, sorry, replace sanitary system. It's on 2259 River Road in Calverton. Um, it's in the core preservation area and um, Julie. Thank you. Again, uh, just to give you a, a brief introduction on this and the applicant is here to address you also. Um, Ken Animal Shelter is on River Road and the Peconic River in Calverton in the town of Riverhead in the core preservation area. Um, in 2012, the uh, Ken Animal Shelter submitted a core hardship application for a complete redevelopment of the site, including an expansion of the facilities. Um, after a long review and a series of public hearings, the proposal was withdrawn. There was no decision on, on that application. Um, Kent has returned with a plan for no expansion and to renovate and reconstruct, reconstruct six buildings on the property, including the administration building and buildings for cat and dog adoptions. Um, no expansions are proposed. Again, uh, there are in-kind reconstructions and renovations. Um, the other two elements of this proposal involve replacing the sanitary system with an innovative on-site alternative wastewater treatment system, 
and natural shoreline restoration of the Peconic River waterfront on approximately 12,700 square feet. And that would be with a natural restoration plan. Um, so we have a proposal and it appears to constitute non-activity pursuant to the act in 5701073 number three, which allows for the replacement and reconstruction of structures. Um, the applicant's consultant is here, Chuck Bowman of Land Use Ecological Services. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, please let me know. Do we have a resolution prepared on that, on your recommendation? No, this would be in the, this would be in the minutes as well. Uh, based, your determination would be in the minutes. Okay. Um, but essentially, it, it's a sewer system, and I, we're just building within the footprint that currently exists. Yes. Um, does Mr. Uh, Bauman want to say anything? Uh, yes, I do. Um, thank you. Um, I know Supervisor Romaine <laughs> knows this project very well, and in the past has been very helpful. We've been years, I'm vice president of Kent Animal Shelter. Uh, and uh, it's been years uh, of us trying to either relocate, build a new shelter, find a home because the buildings are uh, antiquated and we really need to do something. Uh, we tried to buy the piece of property across the street, uh, but we didn't have the proper zoning. And quite frankly, uh, there is no zoning anywhere that allows an animal shelter and no one wants one next to them. So that being said, we went back to square one. We tend to uh, renovate uh, most of the buildings um, and by renovate uh, new plumbing, new wiring, uh, new siding, new roof, uh, we're going to be replacing in kind the existing kennel building uh, in the same footprint, no increase in square footage. And we are going to take uh, the uh, building that's uh, located on the uh, south uh, west corner uh, that is now functional uh, a cottage. We're going to turn that into an isolation building in the same footprint, same uh, square footage. And most importantly, the existing sanitary system is in groundwater now because it was built in the 50s, right down near the river. And we are going to be instituting a new sanitary system that is going to be moved all the way up to the north. It's a hill all the way up to the north uh, side of the property. It's going to be pumped up there where we have a 29 foot elevation and we have good filtration in order to improve uh, and the water quality of the river. Uh, Julie had talked about a buffer area because we are in the uh, Wild Scenic and Recreational River District. Um, so uh, DEC uh, in the past, which had approved the expansion, had wanted a buffer to screen the shelter from uh, the uh, river. Uh, so uh, we had agreed to that, but uh, we have also offered to screen it with more uh, compatible plants than DEC wanted. Uh, we had red maple and white pine, and we certainly are more willing to, if the commission wants, uh, institute a more oak pine buffer screen, uh, and as well as uh, replace uh, any trees uh, with vegetation. We're not going to be uh, removing many trees at all. Uh, the parking lot stays the same. Parking lot's going to have drainage in it where it does not now. Um, and uh, most of the area is lawn with some uh, mature trees in it, which we will certainly try to avoid when we put the new sanitary system in. So I would, I would appreciate your consideration. It's been a long road, uh, that's for sure. Thank you, Mr. Bowman. Any questions? Uh, Mr. Bowman, can um, any uh, components of the new septic system, inclusive of the uh, septic tank, be uh, put within the uh, below the existing uh, parking area in order to uh, minimize any uh, tree cutting or removal? Well, I, Marty, I, I think we can minimize it by where we have it, you know, and you know that we have to have load bearing uh, uh, covers on it if we put in the parking area, but the parking area is actually is much lower 
So we're going to be much closer to groundwater. Okay. And what I thought was a better, and as did uh, John Congdon, our engineer, is we're trying to pump it up to an elevation of 29 so that we have a significant uh, depth to groundwater and certainly a much better potential for filtration of the effluent. And uh, you uh, indicated as part of your testimony that you are willing to offset the loss of any uh, trees that need to be cut for the purpose of the septic upgrade by uh, planting uh, trees as part of the buffer restoration or elsewhere on the uh, property, correct? Yeah, absolutely. The, the balance of the property actually is, is, we try to keep it as kind of park-like uh, mm -hmm. because that's where people meet their uh, adopted friends and uh, walk around. Uh, we also have the potential uh, by looking at when we actually stake out the sanitary lines and moving them so that we avoid any tree removal where possible. And yes, we, we, we can, we will replace them and make uh, an attempt to do so and increase the buffer area along the river. Right. That application is, is already into DEC based upon uh, the commission's decision uh, we will amend that landscape plan and send it into DEC to review for the uh, river's permit modification. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, so at this point is what is the uh, consensus of the commission in terms of whether or not this is um, non-development? Um, it appears based upon the uh, staff uh, review and based upon the information uh, presented today, uh, that uh, the uh, proposed uh, replacement of the uh, shelter and the uh, septic upgrade should be deemed non-developed. I'll second that, Riverhead. We don't usually do motions specifically. It's generally a consensus that it's non-development. I'll defer to John, though. Okay. That's our typical, you don't pass. The reason you don't pass a resolution is if it's non-development, it's outside your jurisdiction. So there's no resolution to can this to agree to pass that, that you had jurisdiction to determine it wasn't within your jurisdiction. Right. The, yeah. the determination that it would be non-development would be the replacement in kind, in place, same mm -hmm. size, no different locations, same everything, just new and not a change of an inch. And the septic system, which we've talked about in the past, have uh, the commissions sort of taken the position that those are um, non-development in the last couple of iterations, mm -hmm. uh, the, last, uh, the last few times we've seen those. Okay. But that's how it's non-development. It's not an expansion. It's not bigger. It's not in a different mm -hmm. location. If we go there today and we go there in a year, it should look the same, just newer. Got it. Okay. Maybe a fewer trees, but a better septic. Okay. 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 So then we're going to move forward where it is considered Good luck. development. Sorry, John. Good luck. Oh. <laughs> oh, oh. Thank you very much. Uh, now we can really uh, get to work and uh, and get our uh, renovation plans done. But and and thank you, Supervisor Remain, for all your help in the past. And. Uh, Thank you, Supervisor. Uh, I haven't met you from Riverhead. Yes. Uh, we are, but we will be down and probably to visit you soon. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Reach out to me and I look forward to working with you. Uh, thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much. So the next item under compatible growth area, item 3H, uh, 215 Rogers Way, referral at Gabreski Airport, West Hampton. So follow up, um, Ms. Hargrave. Thank you. Yeah, just to go back over this proposal, uh, this is at Gabreski Airport in West Hampton in the town of Southampton in the compatible growth area of the Central Pine Barrens in the Gabreski Industrial Park. In February, the commission discussed a referral from the town of Southampton involving the development of an 18 acre area of the 58 acre area industrial park with an 88,000 square foot warehouse and 199 parking spaces and 325 
than stalls for a warehouse at that site. The commission discussed traffic impacts and the um, town forwarded the traffic study uh, that was completed for this project that's been provided to the commission. Um, it's also provided on the website with other meeting materials that are public. And um, the commission staff reviewed the Gabreski files and identified that in 1996, the county sent a letter to the commission seeking a determination of jurisdiction on the industrial park based on Gabreski's 1990 airport master plan, which included the development of an industrial park on the airport property, which is now the site of the Gabreski Airport PDD that the town of Southampton approved in 2007. So uh, for, for non-aviation uses, um, there's at least uh, about 510,000 square feet of development that will occur in the industrial park. But again, that was contemplated and reviewed and presented in the 1990 Gabreski Airport Master Plan, which predated the act. So based on the 1996 determination of the commission, this is, uh, the commission has no jurisdiction to review this proposal um, at uh, Gabreski Airport Industrial Park. Do you have any questions? Thank you, Julie. Okay, thank you. The, the next item under is under the credit program item 3I, the Harriet Murphy letter of interpretation credit appeal in Northampton, um, a decision, Mr. Tiberti. Good afternoon again. Uh, so we have drafted the decision um, which suggests to allocate 0. Uh, 14 credits to uh, both uh, parcels and it's based on the status of the parcels as of 1995 and back then it was one parcel so if we apply the formula and treat it as one parcel um, we would come up with the allocation of 0 0.14 credits um, for both for both parcels So okay. that, that's what we suggest to. Jerry, did you provide a draft resolution on this? Yes, we provided a draft resolution in an e-packet. Um, so thank you, Jerry. I just want to point out in the final review of the resolution that was written in the final this, the proposed decision, um, we noted there were a couple of minor grammatical typos. So we wanted to make those changes. So the one that you received the change principally is if we identified a parcel as HM parcel, we were consistent throughout our decision to refer to them as the HM parcels. I think it makes it easier to read so that you, you, don't, under, you don't get confused of which parcel you're referring to. The other thing was we added one sentence to explicitly state that the parcels were in the town's old file map area, which explains why we use the allocation formula of 0.2 rather than 0.16. Um, I think the commission staff has written a resolution um, to adopt the written decision, which includes a secret determination um, of no environmental impact because on the balance, when the plan was drafted, they analyzed the impact of uh, issuing credits to the entire Harriet Murphy holding. The vast majority, the vast, vast majority have been purchased by the county. They'll never receive credits. Therefore, the allocation assigned to the Murphy holding was much greater than what she's actually going to receive, which is now 0.14. So there is hardly an impact. There's actually less of an impact under the plan, um, just the way the acquisition worked. Um, so if those meet with your approval, you'll need a resolution. I'm sorry, Judy, to steal your Zoom microphone. I so you, you should have received a copy of the draft resolution in your e-packet. It was someone... Uh, make a motion to approve the draft draft resolution. Yeah, I'll make a motion to uh, approve the uh, draft resolution to allocate 0 0.14 Pine Barrens credits. Is there a second? I'll second the motion. Thank you. Any discussion? I just have to vote for it. Okay. Um, all in favor? Aye. Okay. Um, 
So the motion passed for the final vote of 4-0. Thank you. Okay. All right, now we've reached the uh, second public comment section in on the agenda. I have, let me just check, uh, see if we got any comments in. We haven't received any further comments um, by email. I don't know if there is, uh, if, I guess we can open it to see if there is anyone in the public that wants, that's present or on phone that would like to provide comment. Please do so by indicating, but raise your hand. They're also able to speak if they want to. They're unmuted. Okay, thank you, Kathy. All right, and we, we have no phone in, right? No phone in. Okay. So I see there is no one indicating a desire to speak. So um, we have one. I'm sorry. And oh. she's saying one. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Judy. Now, is there a person? I don't see them. Someone. Is there looks like a phone in, but I'm not 100% sure because there's no phone number, but there's a, I'll give him a chance to unmute himself a moment, but um, it's Peter Fontaine. Oh, he's from Tanner Brookhaven. Yeah. Right. He said, oh, I get it. Peter. Hi, I'm not, yes, I'm here. I'm not here to answer, uh, to speak on the public comment period. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Peter. Oh. All right. So now uh, we've reached the end of the agenda. Um, we will need to have a brief closed advisory session. Uh, uh, we'll need a motion to adjourn the meeting to go into advisory session to discuss leader, legal matters and the commission will not return to public session to conduct further business. I have a motion. So moved. Thank you. So moved. Start. Morty, okay. Um, well, could, you, hey, could you resend out the phone number? Because otherwise, you got to fly back in and find out, find out where it was originally um, you know, tendered. So that would be useful. Sure. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. So motion passed four zero. Okay. So we'll we'll um, hear from you soon. And uh, I guess Julie, can you resend the phone number to them? Right to our emails. That would be great. Yes. 